the introduction. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for being here. After such an amazing lunch, I would rather like to have a long slip. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I would do uh, in this very limited time, because, you know, scientists tend to speak a lot. And they, I mean, for them, hours are even less. So I would not really... Uh, give you lots of detail of it, and then I understand the generic nature of the audience as well, so I would rather confine myself to one topic, and that is drug discovery and development. Okay, uh, you see, uh, we all understand that there is a need of, uh, of a drug discovery process. We all understand that the natural capacity to understand diseases at molecular level and developing drugs is absolutely essential. It is like drug uh, security issues as if you are actually discussing food security issues. The question is how many of us are actually contributing towards drug discovery and development? Uh, not really many of us because of a very simple fact that drug discovery and development largely become a process which requires lots of money. So you're talking about $1.8 billion, and you're talking about 1,200 scientists working together for about 10 years or so to develop new molecular entity, one new molecular entity. Despite that, you don't really find many drugs coming. So what I would do in next uh, 25 minutes or so, I would actually give you my understanding of how we can contribute in this very important field how we can contribute in, in bringing forth new investigational drug against diseases. And uh, if you uh, allow me to, to briefly introduce that uh, drug discovery approaches, serendipity remain an extremely important part of, uh, of drug discovery. Uh, and you can relate that with your own country. Uh, and then target-based screening of libraries, because somehow uh, people have thought that they, sh they understand diseases at molecular level, and they, those mole molecules become their target, and they start screening large libraries. And then phenotypic screening, forward, forward pharmacology. And of course, there are many approaches. I don't take much of your time. I'll just proceed further. And I'll, I'll give you an example of two of the approaches. Uh, somewhere, somehow, people have thought that they understand disease at molecular level. And this was a reductionist approach because they thought one disease is because, through, because of one molecule. And if you fix that molecule, you would be able to treat that disease. And that become target-based screening, which is still the mainstay of drug discovery and development. And when you have a, a, a biochemical a molecule which you think is dis causing disease, then you screen large libraries of compound, and then it becomes kind of a reductionist approach. This has not re really re yielded lots of results because human physiology is much more complex than, than, uh, than uh, you know, considering it to so reduce to only one molecule. It is extremely complex, and this is the reason why there is a lot of free thinking about it. There is phenotypic screening, which makes sense. You know, you have a molecule, and you want to make sure you want to make sure that that molecule is is working in fully integrated biological system. So it is kind of a phenotypic screen, a screening in which we have fully assembled biological system. And you first prove that your molecule is actually working in that system. That can be animal or it could be as simple as cell. But it is certainly much better than having pure biochemical in hand because uh, even the cell has every component of, uh, of life cycle. So it is important that we f use this approach. And what I would do, actually, I would demonstrate to you what we have done very recently and got our results patented and by using this approach. Uh, this is the approach of using microorganisms, microbes, and looking into the drug which function against them. We understand multi-drug resistance is a major problem. We understand that, unfortunately, drug resistance is a cross-cutting problem. It is something which is affecting everybody's life. It is a major and enduring threat to human survival and, of course, survival of all living beings which are affected from infection. So you see this thing coming all over. So that can be just a very general topic of coffee uh, table journals to lots of scientific studies 
which uh, actually tells you that drug resistance is a major issue. And drug resistance uh, in all drugs, you know, it's not only antibiotics or antiparasitic compound, it can be anti-cancer. And it is, situation is extremely complex in case of bacteria because bacteria tend to develop resistance much more quickly than anything else on the face of the earth. And they do it in a multitude of ways. So they have the mechanism of uh, protecting the cell wall. So they change the chemistry of the cell wall and do not let the in antibiotics enter into the cell. And even if the antibiotics enter into the cell, then they have the mechanism of either chopping it off or pushing it out from, uh, from the cell, and that is called efflux pump. Uh, so it's extremely complex. Uh, it is uh, mind-boggling that how microorganisms are capable of defending themselves, and as a result, you have bad bugs. You have bad bugs everywhere. If some of you are doctors, you know that it is difficult to treat infections today because they, these microorganisms learn how to chop uh, the antibiotics out and to... To, uh, to use them for their own benefit. Sometimes they just use uh, antibiotics as a carbon source. So imagine what are the approaches you would have. Uh, you have these amazing diseases which are threatening the survival of human race. And you would have uh, perhaps the most obvious is three approaches. You, you would say, I would continue to invest lots of money and discover, develop new antibiotics. The second is that I would take the new and uh, old antibiotics and modify their structure so they become effective again for at least for the time being. Both of them are not really very cost effective because it takes long time, long years and lots of money to develop these two approaches. What we have done, we have used the approach of, we don't want to touch antibiotics, we want to use existing antibiotics, and then we want to have helper molecule, which can, which can help these antibiotics of, to function in bacterial cells. So what I'm going to tell you is example of uh, our work on three microorganisms, but I would just, we have been working on three microorganisms, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, and also E. coli recently, and uh, I would just focus on superbug, and I would really invite you to read this book. This is one of the most fascinating piece of scientific literature. It can tell you how, uh, the, how severe the problem is that near future global toll of antibiotic resistance is 10 million deaths per year. So you're really talking about a huge problem and that this book actually focuses on one microbe which is called Staphylococcus aureus, which causes all kinds of problems. You know, This is everywhere. It used to be a nosocomial hospital acquired uh, problem, but it is now in the community. Many of you are actually carrying it. Is opportunistic in nature, so if your immune system compromised, it would attack on you and create lots of problems. It is topical, it is systemic, whole range of different problem, problem which you can expect from a Staphylococcus aureus. And this is the kind of statistics which you would actually acquire if you go to the hospitals in Colombo. You would find that the doctors find no antibiotics functioning against Staphylococcus aureus. This is a problem. Even the drug of choice like vancomycin is only 21% active and one has to look into the polypharmacy to actually treat the infections caused by. So what we have done, I, I, I just want to give you one example of how a scientific thinking can mature into some tangible results. So what we have done was that why don't we just check uh, the 14,000 compound which we have in our library against this microorganism and check whether these compounds are capable of affecting those micro, this Staphylococcus aureus. And I want, to, I want to show you some of the most fascinating results which we have got, which has actually now patented internationally and there are lots of interest in them. For instance, this is a plant and your country is blessed with plants. You know, your country has lots of medicinal plants. This plant is known for topical, topical applications against infection. So it is a well-known anti-infectious plant. We isolated this particular compound, which is a very simple compound. As a chemist, we don't really feel excited about it. It is a monoterpene, and there is a benzoic acid part. And you see, what, you, uh, what is the baseline? Baseline is that this methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus uh, vancomycin is about 22% active, ciprofloxin, oxycillin, absolutely no work. Uh, and this compound is about 79% active against this AMRSA-17. Uh, so 
it is working. I mean, you, I, we have absolutely no idea what was the target. We had no idea about the biochemistry. We didn't really care about how it is working. What is the target? The only thing which we worked was that we had a fully integrated bacterial system and we wanted to know whether this compound work against that. And that's what we have done. Okay, so uh, what, uh, uh, what was the second thing which we have done was that we screened uh, various derivatives of that compound. Many of them came from plant. It is about 80% active, and let me show you an interesting slide. You see, uh, even if you're not a chemist, you would be able to see that this part of the molecule has no hydroxy, and this uh, has hydroxies. When it has hydroxies, uh, they were not active at all. And when they were devoid of any hydroxyl group, they were active, active at a very high level. And what it tells you, it tells you a very simple thing that you, you need to have a lipophilic part of the molecule to interact with this cell wall. And that was the very, very important point because you go into literature and you find that more, many lipophilic compounds are capable of affecting the cell wall. So this was the baseline and and very simple thing that this, is, this compound is actually working by affecting the cell wall. And now I want you to kindly remember this sentence, and I want to take you through another series of compounds. This is a compound which was isolated again from a plant which is very well known against infection. And this, you see this is a monoterpene. Uh, this is an isoprene unit, and it has an hydroxy group, 74% active. And if, uh, if there is a compound devoid of any hydroxy group, it is absolutely mind-boggling. 91% active in front of all antibiotics which do not really work. So what you see that this part of the molecule is affecting the cell wall. This was the basic thing which we have learned from the initial screening and I want to show you. Unfortunately, the light is just too bright, otherwise you would be able to see the happy and healthy colony of Staphylococcus aureus, the grape-like structure. And when you expose, is it possible to turn off these lights actually? Yeah, can we turn Should be. The one which we need is not. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, okay, so you see, uh, when you expose this colony, I think it's better to just turn it off. There's uh, plenty of light from all over, so you don't need to. Okay, you kindly. Uh, okay, so you see that uh, you see that uh, the colony simplified. There are less of the cells, and also if you see little hard, you would find that these cells are diffused. They are not a properly grape-like structure. You know, they have been. Let's go, uh, kindly turn it off also. They are diffused in their cell wall, and that was the first uh, first indication that initial inference that uh, the uh, the compound is actually working on the cell wall was the right one. Because here you see that the debris coming out, cells are diffused. The cell wall chemistry has been affected, and I want to take you through very quickly. So what we have done, we want you to know. Uh, okay, so. Uh, First thing is that this molecule, which I have taken as an example, is affecting the cell wall of this microorganism. And I, I believe that all of you understand that uh, these uh, bacteria have uh, peptidoglycan cell wall. They are generally uh, bilayer, uh, but in this case, it, is, uh, uh, it was a monolayer. So we want you to know uh, whether this initial in inference was right. Is it really correct that it is affecting the cell wall? This was a question which we asked to ourselves, and we used lots of molecular probes. We wanted to know what actually happened to the cell wall. Now I want to tell you that, uh, that the cell wall chemistry, uh, uh, the cell wall health is, uh, is monitored by, uh, by a very simple fact. You know, viability, as we have as a human, our viability is actually checked by vital science and biochemistry. Bacterial cell viability is checked by membrane potential because they're supposed to have healthy bacteria, supposed to have a good membrane potential, you know, because membrane potential across the membrane is absolutely essential in order to have a healthy bacteria. So this was the first thing which we wanted to which we wanted to know, and what has happened was this is the colony, 
without this micro uh, this compound and once we expose this colony this actually tells you about the forward scattering and side scattering and you see here the colony reduced in size the number of bacterial cells have been have reduced something like 10% and the debris start coming out of the cell. So this was flow cytometric uh, indication, and uh, we wanted to know what actually happened. I want to tell you membrane potential. You know, uh, if, this, if the bacterial cell is healthy, the, the membrane potential is about minus 180 millivolt between the out and uh, inside. And it has a negative charge. So if you have a dye back, if you have an anion dye, uh, negative charge would not be able to enter into the cells. So this is the first indication. But if you have a compound which is negative and capable of entering into the cell, that means membrane potential is affected. And that we, what, what we have done, by using different micro uh, uh, probes, we were able to know that 81% of the cell uh, uh, in uh, and, and about 92% of the cells are affected. In this case, uh, if you see uh, that about 92% of the cells uh, were capable have, to have this negative dye inside, and that actually reflects that the membrane potential, the cell was not healthy, the membrane potential was affected, uh, the cell depolarized. Cell is just like a light bulb, you know, so depolarized, and as a result, what actually happened? You know, in cell wall, there are lots of things. There are transport proteins, so-called porins of different kind, there are receptors of different kind, but there is one very important kind of a protein which is called efflux protein. These are like active pumps, and these pumps, uh, five different groups of proteins, they are capable of identifying xenobite, uh, alien substances like antibiotics, and pump them out. They just identify them, combine them, and they pump them out from the cell, and this is one of the most important mechanisms through which microbes uh, defend themselves. We wanted to know what actually happened to the cell wall efflux pump. Once you have an efflux pump, what, how it affected the, uh, uh, the, uh, the concentration of the antibiotic. So what we have done was that we conducted study uh, we have done a very simple trick. We took our compound, we took different antibiotics, and we have taken uh, a dye. So when we uh, do not have our compound, the dye is not capable of entering into the cell. But we, when we expose this colony with this compound, the dye is capable of entering into the cell, and also at the same time, the, these antibiotics enter into the cell also. So what this compound is doing, a very simple thing, is inhibiting the efflux pump. They are inhibiting the protein pumps which are on the cell wall. So that, uh, that was a very important indication and through which we have actually determined that our compound is capable of destroying the cell membrane by two Two manner. One is membrane potential depolarization, and the second was that efflux pump was affected. So, how the cell cells look like once they are affected? They are happy, healthy colonies, grape-like structure. Uh, but once you expose them, this happened to them. This is what actually happens to them. And what is actually happening? That you see lots of cell debris. We were even able to identify some of these. Uh, a micro or uh, cellular organelles out of. Second thing, uh, it breaks the biofilm, so it affects the biofilms also. And then you see what actually happened. This is a normal cell, but once you expose these cells with, uh, with this compound, cells start emptying, you know, the cells start rupturing the cell membrane got rupture at different point, and at the same time, they start dividing in a weird manner. Cells, instead of dividing into two, we all understand this is a binary fusion, instead of dividing into two, they start dividing into four and three and five and so You just name it because they're unhealthy cells and they have been grossly affected uh, through this compound. Now, how they actually look like. We use uh, an amazing technique called atomic force microscopy in which we slide the laser tape on the cell surface. So we just go and slide the cell surface. This is healthy colony. Uh, this is healthy cell, and I can even tell you that this is about 275 micrometer in size. So it is like a Doppler effect. I tell you the size of the cell, and I tell you how big it is. 
But once you expose that with, uh, uh, with your compound, the compound which I mentioned, that what actually happens. The cell is now only 0 0.77 micrometer. So it reduced in size, collapsed entirely, and at the same time, the mitochondrion, Golgi bodies, everything start coming out of the cell, uh, and that is what actually happened. So this, is, this was the first uh, proof, the direct proof that the cell membrane is affected grossly. We have done it in uh, directly, but now you see what actually happened to the cell. The question was uh, why it actually happens, and I want to tell you this was the most curious thing. Uh, you see, what we have done was that we have done phenotypic screening. We proved that this compound is actually working against this bacterial cell. We were absolutely not worried about the mechanism because mechanism comes later. But once we show that this compound is actually working, we start probing into, because we are scientists, we, want, we start probing into, into the molecular mechanism. What we have discovered is absolutely fascinating. We discover that this compound is doing nothing but insulting the cell. It's called cell insult, and that is called in immunological term. It is actually triggering a defense system in cell, and cell identify this compound as a as something which need to be oxidized, xeno xenobitic. As a result, it, it start producing reactive oxygen species, lots of quantities of reactive oxygen species. And these reactive oxygen species which are produced by the bacterial cell start damaging the bacterial cell itself. So these reactive oxygen species which are perceived to be defending the cell start uh, oxidizing the cell membrane. So what we have done, we chopped the cell off, we took the uh, protein out of the membrane and look into the LCMS, MS, and we found that lots of different uh, biomolecular components were further oxidized, and that proved that the mechanism through which this compound is actually working is very simple, insulting the cell, and as a result, the cell is producing reactive oxygen species, which is kind of a suicidal for them also. Now, what is the end of it? End of it is the following. End of it is that if you take uh, uh, antibiotics, for instance, in this case I can show you, uh, the antibiotic uh, clindamycin uh, uh, is about 400, 4,000 microgram per ml. 4,000 microgram is required to kill the cell. This particular compound is about 25 microgram, but in combination of that, the clindamycin, 8 microgram per ml. The MIC reduced to about 1,000 fold over. And this uh, clindamycin become absolutely effective to a very, very low dose because what this compound has done, help the antibiotics to rupture the cell and go into, into the cell and affect it. So you need very low concentration of uh, this particular compound. And in combination of it, which is called fractional inhibitory concentration, this compound, this compound was able to help uh, already uh, useless antibiotics to become very effective. So this was a very uh, important observation. This, has, this was then patented. And uh, we uh, have now lots of interest into it. Uh, I just want to show you one more uh, example in next two, three minutes. There is an enzyme called urease, which is extremely important, and it is uh, the reason uh, two people have got Nobel Prize because they have identified that there is a microorganism called Helicobacter pylori, which live in our gut and produce urease, and urease is the reason why Helicobacter pylori is capable of surviving at the, base, at the very acidic pH of the stomach. This is Helicobacter pylori, and this is uh, able to survive because there is an enzyme called urease which create a localized basic pH. But I want to show you the structure of uh, urease. Urease is a large uh, protein and is an intracellular protein. So about 30% of the microorganisms suicide. They destroy themselves, produce this urease, which then combine extracellularly on remaining 70% of the colony. And that is the reason why they are able to survive. And it has two nickel atom. It has two nickel atoms. So now we want you to know what actually we can do uh, with this particular enzyme. And this is the example of target-based drug discovery. So what we have done was that uh, I'll, I'll show you. These are the compounds which were isolated from a Sri Lankan lichen. And they were active against urease. So what we have taken that an example 
This was isolated from a plant, and you see these are three components. And I'll show you in the next few slides that uh, the most active compound among, the, among them was this one. So we just chopped it off, and we find that the activity is not reduced. These were monocomerines were not active. Only the dicomerine of this nature was active, and we wanted to know how it is active. So we synthesized various analogs of this compound, and uh, we discover that uh, that this actually goes into the two nickel atom. It just, you know, if you're a scientist, you, the most obvious conclusion you would have that these uh, compound along through their sulfur and oxygen atom is interacting with the nickel. But very first time we discover that the, cell, the molecule turn itself into one, uh, it, about, it is about 170 degree. Half of that goes into the nickel atom. And uh, this particular uh, molecule, which has a big uh, substituent, is not able into the, into the active site. What actually happened that uh, through, by using a nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, we were able to identify something very interesting. Very first time that none of these polar atoms are contributing in inhibiting of the enzyme. This is only the benzene atom, this benzene moiety, which actually goes deep inside the cell, and uh, deep inside the nickel atoms, chop, chop this thing up, and these two, uh, two nickel atoms form a metal, ferrocin, metal aromatic complex called metal pi complex, and that's how this inhibits the urease enzyme. So uh, that is what I wanted to present. I wanted to present to you was primarily two uh, examples. One was photophenotypic screening, and the other was target based screening, and there were lots of very good people who contributed in this work. And lastly, I would like to show you the institute uh, where many of you have actually worked. This is called HEG Institute. This is Dr. Panjwani Center, where I and my colleague, Dr. Sonia, are working. This is uh, Dr. Tarman Center, and you find that most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, Sri Lankan flag is flying because someone from Sri Lanka is working in this building. And this is. Uh, this is our genome center. We have recently completed five genomes of our ethnic population. This is the largest paper li paperless library in this part of the world with 31,000 online journals, and it is connected to our satellite called Park Parksat 2. This is our new research building, industrial medical center. Many of you have stayed in guest house. And this is our clinical work, and I would end by saying that in order to develop drugs, drug locally, you need to have an approach which is different from FDA approach, and you need to have all ingredients of a basic research. At the same time, you need to have a world-class clinical facility. For instance, in this case, we have 120 bad hospitals. Thank you very much for your patience. We have time for questions. Yes, sir. Maybe we'll field one question. One question, okay. Or maybe we should reserve all the questions for the end. But we'll, we'll take what? one now. Okay. Hello. Roshan, you're loud enough. Uh, you uh, can. Not really. We haven't gone that far. We were more interested of knowing what actually happened, but let me tell you, indirectly we know that uh, there is mainly hydroxyl radical which found to be uh, found to be incorporated in most of the cell debris which come out and by LCMSMS. We were able to identify some of the proteins which were more oxidized as compared to control with hydroxy group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.